Hello and welcome to National Archaeology Week 2020. My name's Nick Hadnut and I'm the Curator of Archaeology at the Queensland Museum. I'm um, standing here at the Cross River Rail Experience Centre which is on Albert Street in uh, Brisbane CBD. Uh, and this is the traditional lands of the Yagara and the Turrbal people. So I pay my respects to the Yagara and Turrbal people and I pay my respects to Aboriginal First Peoples. Uh, I acknowledge their enduring uh, connection with country uh, and sea and I thank them for the opportunity to speak here today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, I th thought today we'd talk a little bit about Queensland Museum and our role within archaeology across the state. Uh, and I thought I'd split that into two parts. So first of all, I'd, I'd initially speak about Queensland Museum as an institution and what we do, and then talk about myself within that as a curator of archaeology uh, and how I became a curator of archaeology and just generally give you a bit of a sense of what that means. Um, so in terms of the presentation, I'll be talking through a number of slides. Um, towards the end of the uh, presentation, there'll be a lot more slides, being that I'm talking about my favourite subject, which obviously is myself. Uh, so in that regard, stick around, you'll see a fair bit towards the end of the presentation. But at the start, let's just talk about the Queensland Museum. So we started in 1862. Uh, the Queensland Philosophical Society is a, a small institution at that time, decided that Queensland as a fledgling state needed a museum. And so with a lot of lobbying to the government, a uh, museum was created and, and our first home was at the windmill, uh, the convict windmill, which is on Spring Hill here in Brisbane. Uh, at that time, there was a culture war that was happening in the world that the Queensland Museum was part of, and that, that culture war in, was engaged around science and religion. Uh, so archaeology in 1862 was a, a really uh, fledgling um, science, um, but along with other sciences such as geology, biology, botany, uh, archaeologists were challenging um, the re uh, religious understanding of the world at that time. And so the Queensland Museum, uh, in its role as an education organisation, felt that we can contribute to that understanding by introducing science and making that available to the people of, uh, of Queensland. Um, and so that role really hasn't changed. The way they did that in 1862 was to open an institution where we had real and authentic artefacts uh, and biological specimens. Um, that showcased Queensland's cultural and natural treasures. And we still do that today. In fact, each year we host an, uh, the World Science Festival, uh, which underlines that role of the Queensland Museum in science itself. Um, but in 1862, archaeology, as I said, was a fledgling science. And at that time, archaeologists, uh, it was very Eurocentric. They were really interested in understanding the deep depth of time of human occupation, particularly around uh, Europe. And, and gradually building that understanding across the world. And there was also an emphasis on understanding ancient civilizations around the Mediterranean. And so our earliest collections in terms of the archaeology collections reflect that international interest. And so we have here an example of uh, two ancient bone tools. These are used for uh, rib, rib bones, they're piercing tools. And you may be able to see those old labels. Uh, 1859, indicating that these, these artefacts were collected from uh, caves in France, in Conzis, uh, in 1859. And so these are some of the earliest examples of archaeology that we have in the Queensland Museum. Um, here an example of a, a wheel thrown ceramic with text uh, indicating that, that emphasis on civilizations as well. And so Queensland Museum, uh, the curators at the time, right up until the 1920s, were really focused on bringing international archaeology into Australia. But in terms of the Australian context, uh, archaeology is really focused on three main areas, uh, particularly in Queensland. So the first area that archaeology is focused on is our first, first peoples. Um, we, uh, people are interested in understanding how long Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have occupied the nation. Um, and we know as our dating techniques improve and as we find more sites, those dates are getting older and older and we've pushed well past 60,000 years ago, moving towards 80,000 years at this point. So incredible depth of time of occupation. And so another area of interest is understanding how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have culturally and technologically changed during that expanse of time 
and what might have forced those changes or why those changes have come about. So it might be climate change, for example. Uh, the glass glacial maximum meant that Australia was a very dry place and how did Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people survive in those very dry conditions. And as we have more uh, First Peoples engaging in archaeology, we are able to see that archaeological science is supporting First Peoples creation stories uh, and their oral traditions. And so there's a, a coming together of the two. Um, so for example, uh, oral traditions talk about uh, sea rise across the coast and obviously we can understand that as the, as the uh, glaciers melted, sea, the seas rose uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, so the other area of interest within Queensland is maritime archaeology. Uh, a lot of people consider that to be um, basically looking at shipwrecks, which is generally where the, the field work is conducted. But it's a crossover of many different disciplines because it, it, uh, maritime archaeology, for example, may be looking at shipwrecks from the Mediterranean. They may be looking at Aboriginal bark canoes. They may be looking at uh, modern shipwrecks from World War II. Um, but the point is that they're looking at the people who created these objects uh, that went down in shipwrecks or were abandoned to understand a little bit more about those people. And then I guess another segue or crossover from maritime archaeology is historical archaeology, um, which looks at, uh, I guess, from a chronological period, it's interested in people from around the 16th century onwards. Um, it's quite Eurocentric in that vision because it's considering, uh, as the title suggests, people's histories in terms of written and oral histories and how we can kind of uh, fact check those histories by looking at the actual remains of artefacts in the ground to understand what people were doing at a time when we could also read an old newspaper to understand what people are doing at that time. And so those are the three main areas um, but within those is hundreds of different specialisations. Um, so people may be interested in rock art, they may be an archaeobotanist who's looking at different types of um, remnants of plant remains to understand what species people were using for what reasons. Uh, they may be bioarchaeologists who are looking at faunal or human remains to understand change across time. Um, so there's a, a huge variation and within uh, historical archaeology, for example, there's a new field emerging over the last few years called contemporary archaeology which is really only focused on the past few years. So strange as it seems, archaeology is really about the th material things that people leave behind and how we understand them. So traditionally we think that archaeology is about deep time, but contemporary archaeologists are interested, for example, in how plastics are washing up on our coastlines, where the plastics are coming from, how they're being produced and, and uh, entering into the system. They may be interested in uh, transient people, how they're living in our cities, how they survive, uh, or migrant people coming into new communities and, and how they're adapting. So there's a, a, an interest, a lot of different interesting research questions. Um, so with the Queensland Museum, uh, we have archaeologists who fit across all of those particular um, specialities. Uh, so we have a maritime archaeologist, people who are interested in indigenous um, uh, archaeology and myself as a historical archaeologist. So I'm just going to check my notes. Um, so here we have an example of a, um, a Queensland artefact. It's a ginger beer bottle. It would have been imported probably from Scotland and then had a transfer pattern of uh, H.E. Bar from Cooktown. And this is an example of a historical archaeology artefact coming from far north Queensland. Um, so in terms of our collections, you have a sense of how we started collecting. Um, let's talk about some fun kind of facts and figures about the Queensland Museum collection. Um, let's start with the oldest artefacts. Uh, what you're looking at here are what are commonly called Paleolithic hand axes. Um, so these are those early collections that the Queensland Museum curators were bringing in in the late 19th century, early 20th century, where people were f beginning to understand the depth of time of human occupation of the planet. Now these tools are over 250,000 years old. They were made by a species before humans, so Homo erectus also. Um, so so these, these tools are indicative of a deep time of people having cognitive function and how that changes over time. Um, in Queensland, our oldest artifacts are, are Aboriginal artifacts. 
uh, and they date to around 20,000 years. Uh, Kenneth Cave is a great example of those particular of, of an assemblage that dates to that time, but they're by no means the oldest assemblages within Queensland. We know that in far north Queensland, archaeologists are finding sites that date back to almost 40,000 years of occupation, and then across in far northwestern Australia, uh, dates are coming forward that are around 80,000 years of occupation. Uh, so in terms of the oldest uh, maritime archaeology artefacts, they would probably be the assemblages that are coming out of the Pandora, which is a shipwreck from 1791, and that's associated with the infamous Mutiny on the Bounty. Um, the oldest historical archaeology artefacts uh, come from the Commissariat Store, which is one of two remaining convict buildings here in Brisbane. Um, and that, uh, that assemblage comprises of over 38,000 artefacts, which is quite amazing when you consider that the commissariat store in itself is a three-storey building. It dates from about 1824. Um, so in terms of our largest artefact, we would have, I, I would put that down to being a World War II bunker. Um, this block of bricks here is actually part of that bunker that was discovered uh, during the inner uh, inner northern busway excavations that happened in Brisbane. Um, so the bunker itself was kind of near King George Square City Hall. It was on the corner of Roma Street and uh, Ann Street. Um, and so when that was discovered, uh, the sections of the bunker, including the door and different components, were removed and brought to the Queensland Museum. So there's a large number of these kinds of components, which don't look like much. But when we look inside them, we can see, for example, this is a, a silhouette uh, of a, if you're looking at an aircraft from below or from the side, um, this one depicts an American patrol bomber. There are a number of these silhouettes. And that takes us back to 1942, uh, sorry, World War II during the 1940s, um, when there was a, a concern of Japanese invasion, when we had Japanese aircraft surveying the Australian coastline, and we also had Americans in Brisbane uh, who were also fighting on the fronts across the Pacific. So in terms of archaeological artefacts, we kind of have a sense of our oldest and our uh, m the biggest uh, artefacts, but we also collect things that actually aren't archaeological in nature. So this image here is, with a beardless me as a scale um, is what we call a fiberglass cast. It's actually fiberglass um, from a site. It was made in 1996. Uh, the site itself is the Scanlon building, um, which was demolished at that time. Prior to that, it was the original convict's lumberyard. So it's at the top of the Queen Street Mall in Brisbane here again. Um, very difficult to see from this image, but basically what we're looking at is a, 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 a wall feature with a lot of debris that's fallen down on the side. I'm pointing towards the corner of the wall. Um, and I guess there's a couple of things to talk about with this image. For me, the, fibre, the fact that it's fiberglass is quite astounding because the detail is incredible. And the way that's achieved um, back in 1996 was to lay uh, multiple layers of latex across the site, um, or a feature in this instance, a wall feature. And the latex would dry, be peeled off, and then you'd use that as a mold, which you'd filled with fiberglass to get something like this. So this is uh, almost three meters by five meters long. As I said, it's a, it's a wall feature. And to give you an indication of the detail, this is a top, uh, a planned view of that. You can see basically in the middle center of the image there, there's a, a base of a glass bottle. Again, it's, it's fiberglass resin, but it gives you a real sense of being there. And I had an opportunity to look at this um, quite recently and spotted in one of the crevices there a, um, a fiberglass copy of an apricot pit. So it just gives you an, a sense of the, the level of detail. Uh, now, today, this, um, this would more likely be done with photogrammetry, uh, where we would take overlapping photographs of the site and then cre uh, create a 3D uh, model, or potentially laser scanning. So that is another thing that we collect as part of the archaeology of Queensland. So we're not only collecting artefacts, but we're collecting representations, and digital representations are becoming more and more uh, important in, in terms of our collecting. So once we understand what we're collecting and why we're collecting, the other thing we need to talk about is how do we determine what to collect? Um, so at the Queensland Museum, we use a process called significance assessment. Um, and what that means is we have a, a number of categories of significance that we 
test a, a, a site or an assemblage against to understand how it scores or how they rank against the different levels of significance. And from there, we can determine if an assemblage is of state significance to come to the state museum. Now, those levels of significance are based on a, a, a highly important cultural heritage document called the Borough Charter, which was written in 1978, named after the town of Borough in South Australia. Uh, and that document sought to understand how people apply heritage significance to a place or a thing. So there's a number, there's multiple types of significance. It's well worth a, a read. There's a short um, version of it online. But for example, a site may have spiritual significance in that it's a place where people um, go for a spiritual purpose. Uh, and that can apply to something like a church, for example, or it might be an indigenous sacred site. Uh, there might be a, a level of aesthetic to something where it looks very attractive or a, uh, or a scientific significance. So there's different layers and we apply those significance um, to sites. Uh, and so that's how we uh, determine what, the site, uh, what sites to acquire. And from there, we bring them into the museum. Uh, and then we consider do we act, can we actually acquire the site in terms of what is it? If it's, if it's a large brick structure, can we actually acquire that or not? Uh, so there's a, a, a level of um, physicality to the collection that we need to consider. And then also we need to do a due diligence assessment, which means we have to test the provenance of the artefact to understand how it was acquired and whether that was legally done. So we're looking for permits and things like that from the government. And also if it's been offered to us, is the entity offering that legally the owner of that? So there's a, a due diligence process that we need to go through as well. So when we are collecting, um, sorry, when we receive assemblages, we, we get them through three main ways. The first way is that we actually go out and do uh, a, a field work ourselves as, as museum archaeologists. We often do that in partnership with perhaps a university or a cultural heritage organisation who's working in the field. Uh, but more commonly, we receive collections that are donated to us and they are most commonly coming from cultural heritage organisations or private businesses that work in, in archaeology uh, in partnership with someone, for example, like the Cross River Rail Development Authority to understand what is being excavated, what's, what's important within that and how to collect that. Uh, and the third way we receive collections most commonly is through university assessments and field work. So research, uh, research being conducted by universities, perhaps by PhD students in the course of their studies, uh, generates assemblages, which then come to the museum and we go through that assessment process. Um, so when we receive the collections, they come in a variety of different types of ways. And this is just a kind of a sense to give you an understanding of what I see uh, behind the scenes. So we might get something like this that's uh, well packaged, well documented, uh, easy to understand. Um, or we might get a shipping container that's uh, all the artifacts are laid out there, but it, uh, clearly a lot more. Uh, so far, far bigger assemblage. There's over 900 artifacts in this, um, this particular shipping container. So once we've made those assessments, uh, then we look at uh, conservation. So conservation needs to come in and work with us to understand what we're collecting and uh, preserve what they can. So obviously when we're collecting artefacts, we're trying to preserve that material culture for future generations. So we're just looking here at a piece of uh, overseas Chinese porcelain. Uh, it's a bowl and uh, it's just sitting on the surface there waiting for an archaeologist to collect it and document where it came from. Uh, it's a Four Seasons pattern, which means it's been hand-painted and it's basically fragmented, dirty, and when it comes to the museum, it would be preserved by a conservator. Uh, so here's an example of the work that they can do. Uh, this is a, a button. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of the image the corrosion. Uh, fortunately, the button itself has a high uh, amount of brass in it, which is a non-ferrous metal, which means it's not rusting, it's simply corroding. But on the right hand side, you can see once that's been uh, conserved, we can actually read the detail around the button to understand more about it. So we, we now know that this button was manufactured in Birmingham by a company named Hardman and Illiff. And it says uh, around the circumference of the button, Hardman and Illiff patent. Uh, so we can now as archeologists search on that, uh, start looking through the documents and understanding that Hardman and Illiff 
uh, went through a number of iterations as a company. Different partners came and went, and so their name changed a number of times, but the name Hardman and Illif, as it stands there, dates to about 1860, 1865. So it gives us a really nice temporal uh, period for that particular piece. Um, and so with, with the archaeology, once, once we've done our conservation, I guess the, the question is why do we do all of that work? And why we're doing all of that work is so that we, are, uh, we have two missions, I guess. One is to collect archaeological assemblages that are deemed to be of state significance and, and clean, protect, preserve those artefacts so that people of Queensland can access them uh, in, in perpetuity for, or for as long as possible. So we provide storage, uh, we provide the expertise to make sure that those collections are maintained. And so in of themselves or in of itself, that, that ideal is simply about preserving what's been excavated because the excavation process itself is a destructive process. Once the artefacts are removed from the context in the ground, uh, we lose that context. So we have to preserve the artefacts. And the other thing that we preserve along with those artefacts is all of the documentation that the archaeologists are, have acquired during that field season and during that post uh, period of um, interpretation and analysis and report writing. And so in the 70s and 80s, uh, if I'm investigating our collections from back then, I'm actually looking through old field journals, uh, handwritten pencil, graph, graph drawings, uh, two and a half inch slides, um, and a, a real sense of the things people carried out in the field with them when they conducted archaeology. Um, but more recently, uh, excavations that come in, I receive a, a link to a, an online file system and there'll be a massive uh, data set, gigabytes and gigabytes, which would be uh, photographs, um, video, drone footage, uh, 3D photogrammetry, um, models, all kinds of, of data that comes in. And so we're collecting the physical and more recently we're collecting the digital. And that in of itself is almost an archaeology. Uh, for example, I needed to access a, a document that came with a collection in 1996 uh, and it was the catalogue. It was all of the data that was collected at that time, but I couldn't open a file from 1996. I had no way of accessing that. It was old. Um, so I had to send it through to some of our IT people who had to do quite a bit of work to actually ex uh, extract the information that I needed out of that. So in of itself, digital data has an ongoing uh, curation process where we need to keep updating that data and the ways that we can access it as well. And so the second uh, reason that museums exist or the reason that we are working um, is to share all of this knowledge with uh, the public, whether that be Queenslanders, people from Brisbane, tourists or internationally. And so we need to take all of the information that's been collected, we need to take the artefacts, we need to bring them into a place where we can examine them, analyse them, interpret them, uh, engage other people to help us in that interpretation. So for example, engage with a university to bring in uh, students, perhaps a PhD student who would look at one particular research question that may be answered by that assemblage and then provide that information to us. And so from there we start to build an understanding of a collection, an understanding of the people whose lives created that collection and then from there we can share that. We can share that virtually through uh, online blogs or vlogs, uh, through online presentations, presentations at the museum, um, we can do that through exhibitions, whether they be virtual exhibitions or physical. And as I was saying, with all the digital data we're collecting, uh, we're more interested now in looking at uh, augmented reality or virtual reality as ways of sharing uh, beyond the boundaries of the museum itself. And so that's really the two main remits that we have as an institution within the archaeology. Uh, one is to preserve the, the artefacts that are being recovered across Queensland every day, and two, is to uh, curate that information into something that we can then provide to our general public so that they have a way of uh, interacting with that shared information. Uh, because after all, archaeology is a shared resource. This is our shared history that goes back tens of thousands of years. Uh, and as a, as a human race, this is our, our shared history. Um, and so I guess in terms of the museum, that kind of 
is where I want to leave that. Um, basically, um, we have a role to play within the archaeology community where we engage, uh, sorry, we close the loop for people who are conducting archaeology uh, by sharing that information with the public who are interested in that. So, so we kind of help close the loop for that. But in terms of my role, um, I guess I thought I'd just talk about how I decided to become an archaeologist uh, and then talk about what I do as an archaeologist. Um, so archaeology is actually my third career, as it were. I came into it quite late, and, and I didn't really understand that I wanted to be an archaeologist. I had really little understanding of what I wanted to do. Um, and so for people who are in the similar boat to me, I actually did an online careers aptitude test, uh, which is a, a multi-choice, 100 word, 100 questions I think I answered. And it just came back with a whole heap of really confusing data about me uh, that was quite conflicting. Um, it told me things like I would like to work outdoors and I like to work indoors. I'd like to work in groups and I like to work by myself. So it, it, it was quite difficult to understand what it was saying, but at the end it kind of suggested that I would like to have a career as a police officer or a scientist, which made no sense to me. I was terrible at science. Um, but then when I thought more about it, the, the, it really summed up archaeology perfectly. So as an archaeologist, I travel, I engage in field work, I work outdoors, I bring artefacts into a lab, I work on a computer in a space in the city, uh, I work in a team when I'm out in the field with a group of people, I work in a team at the museum, but most often I'm on a computer by myself. So there was a whole lot of contradictory stuff that came through that, that process and enabled me to consider archaeology as a career. And from there, I get, uh, enrolled at the University of Queensland and I did a, a double major in archaeology and then went on to do an honours program in archaeology. Um, both of those were supervised by Associate Professor John Pragnell, who will be on later this week, um, which was fantastic. He's an amazing historical archaeologist. I was very privileged to be working with him. Uh, and so from there, when I was at university, I spent a whole lot of time volunteering all of my free time as much as possible, uh, working with different people, different lecturers and uh, PhD people um, to assist them in their research. But also it gave me a real sense of what I like to do as research. So uh, this slide here is a uh, faunal remains. Um, one of the things I had to do as a volunteer was count large assemblages like this. So I had to go through, count, pick out all the bones, separate them, work out which, was, which parts were diagnostic in that we could understand what species they were from, what part of the animal they were from. Uh, I did that with uh, fish otoliths, for example. Um, I quickly came to realise that counting bones was horrible and I didn't want to do that. Uh, so then I moved on to working with indigenous artefacts and eventually I ended up working with historical archaeology um, which made a lot more sense to me. I could kind of place it in my own personal experience and that's when I decided to focus on historical archaeology. And one of the things I was fortunate to do at that time was uh, conduct field work. I, I went on field work with a PhD student. Uh, every year for two weeks we'd go out in the field and the people I met during that field work uh, I still am connected with today. There's a, a real close cohort of people. And one of those people actually worked at the Queensland Museum and they needed someone to come in and work with them doing exactly the same stuff I'd been doing at the university, which was counting and sorting things, um, but it was blacksmithing tools. So a little bit different to the bones, but as still it gave me a foothold in uh, with the museum. And I guess the theme there is that whilst I was studying and working really hard at that, I was also working really hard at uh, volunteering and building a whole system of networks of people that could help me um, in order to become an archaeologist. And the reason I did that was I was really interested in archaeology, but also jobs are scarce. Um, there are a, a lot more jobs today than there were when I first started. Um, things are changing, but how many archaeologists do you personally know? There's not many of us around. Um, so getting a, a, a leg up on the competition is really important, and a great way to do that is through volunteering. Um, so this is where you'll find me in my happy place. Uh, this is me in an excavation trench, um, pondering the, the wiles of the world. Uh, here I am doing some fine, fine excavation work. Um, 
And it's really quite a difficult process excavating. It seems quite easy, you just dig with a trowel and away you go. But in actual fact, what we're doing is looking for changes in the texture of the soil or changes in the color of the soil that may indicate some kind of cultural change in that space. Um, we're obviously trying not to damage anything as we're removing that. Uh, and so we're thinking the whole time, um, how, have, we, have we photographed this area properly before we remove it? Have we documented everything we found? Are the buckets too full? Uh, when's lunch? All of these kinds of things are happening as we spend on average eight to ten hours out in the field each day and then we all troop home uh, and we're returning with all of this material culture that we've collected out in the field. Um, so as a museum archaeologist, I really have uh, one job, and that job is to understand the collection as a whole, how it was gathered, what information supports it, what stories is it telling, and then consider that in the broader framework of Queensland to understand where are those gaps. So where do I need to be focusing my efforts in order to find uh, sites that help fill a gap that can then tell a broader story about Queensland. And so in doing that, I have amazing opportunities uh, to travel around the state. Um, this is a photograph I took out of a helicopter as we flew into the, the rainforest in far north Queensland. Um, we spent a couple of days up there with traditional owners documenting a significant cultural artifact, um, a dendroglyph, and there's been some quite a bit of news media around that recently. Um, but the opportunity to sit in a field, wait for a helicopter and then get chop it into a site and then march another couple of hours further up into the, the virgin rainforest was, was really amazing opportunity. Um, on the other side is the state working out in uh, Birdsville. Um, so, you know, the, the, the contrast in terms of the environments that I'm working in, the distances that I'm covering. Uh, this example of a photograph is out near Birdsville. Uh, a few hundred kilometres further over the horizon is the Simpson Desert. Um, and in actual fact, what we're doing here is um, called sieving. I loathe this job. It's one of the parts of field work where you're effectively bringing the buckets that are being excavated uh, by the people who are finding all the amazing things as they're digging, and then you're emptying those through a sieve, sieving them and finding all of the really tiny, amazing artefacts. Um, it's hard going. Um, but yeah, that's one of, the, one of the jobs that we do and in that environment, fortunately it was winter, so it was a um, beautiful, beautiful time to do that field work. Um, this is kind of a typical uh, trench, one by one metre, uh, very uncomfortable, lots of artefacts both within the, the excavation unit and outside of the excavation unit. It just kind of gives you a sense of how it looks out in the field. Um, we're hiding under a, a tarp there to keep us cool in the 40, 41 degree heat uh, in North Queensland. There's lots of uh, buckets being filled with rubble that are all going off to the people to be sieving. Uh, and this was a bit of a time out, take a quick photo um, and then continue to work. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a, I, I guess, an example of what Australian archeology span can look like. And then I guess in terms of scale, if we start thinking about size of artefacts, I spoke earlier about the, the command bunker as being a large object full of bricks. Uh, this is my trowel and at the very pointy end of the trowel you'll see there's a cylinder um, with a tiny little hole on the end. Uh, you'd easily lose that in all of those rocks and, and one of the things we do as archaeologists is we walk transects or emu parades backwards and forwards across a landscape looking for cultural artifacts on, or features on the surface. This one would have been pretty easy to lose but someone with eagle eyes spotted it um, and it's actually a pen nib so this is uh, an example of what we found. Um, again it's been conserved by the museum conservators and so as a result of that it's been stabilized but we can also read that pen um, detail on the pen nib. Um, it says Joseph Gillett's public pen number six. Um, and this artifact was one of the artifacts that we recovered uh, about 10 years ago now when the museum was uh, involved in a search for a Burke and Wills campsite out in Birdsville. Uh, so these tiny little fragments, the little clues all come together. Uh, we collected 160 artifacts from that excavation and from there we're able to connect with a, a, an amazing story of exploration at Queensland. Um, 
So again, just to juxtapose, I guess, in terms of the, some of the types of excavations, this one's a little bit more complicated uh, than, than the, one I, the, the excavation unit I showed you a few moments ago. You can see there's different layers of stratigraphy, which is the, the kind of layering through the soil. Uh, and in the center of the photo, highlighted by the two uh, rulers, is a pit, a pit that's been excavated into that underlying white gypsum soil. Um, so that, that's a human uh, interaction in that landscape. People dug that hole, put things into it and buried it, uh, and which is exactly what we were searching for as part of the Burke and Wills story. Um, and so through excavating that as a separate feature, we, we found bullets and, and other artifacts within the, the bottom of that. Um, so, so field work is a process of collecting and documenting as we collect. Um, but it's also a process of uh, recording and analysing the artefacts and protecting those as they go. And so in this instance, I'm out in the field doing that process, but more often I'll be in a lab at the Queensland Museum um, with the equipment around me that I need. For example, here we've got a photography set up. Uh, I'm measuring, weighing, uh, recording all of that raw data about the artefacts. If there's any text, anything like that, uh, it all goes into a database. And from there, we're able to uh, start to extrapolate the story and start to build that up a little bit more. Um, so as a curator, I do the field work, collect the data, analyze the data, and then start to interpret that for the, that storytelling that I was speaking about earlier. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is to get help. Uh, I'm not an expert by any means in, in many of the facets of the archaeology. As I said, there's so many different kinds of archaeology. So we look for partnerships. Um, partnerships with people like uh, Niche, for example, uh, who are working on the Cross River Rail, um, or with universities, or um, a partnership between all three of us. And so that we get expertise from, um, from the university, um, from students who are looking at different aspects of the collection. They'll have specific research questions. They fit within a research framework. And so we interrogate the data from all these different questions and start to build up a really nuanced understanding of what these artifacts are telling us. And so once we've started to build all of that data set together, um, then we start looking at ex exhibition. And so this is another really cool part of my job in that as a curator, I get to work with curators from other museums. Um, I assist with installations of big touring exhibitions that are archaeological in nature. Um, this is me hanging out with an Egyptian mummy. Um, but also we get to put on our own exhibitions as well. And so this one here, um, I was able to co-curate with Dr. Kate Quirk. Uh, and this is an exhibition that, that focused on that Burke and Wills field work that we did about 10 years ago, which was, which was a really great exhibition. And so I guess um, that concludes where I'm at uh, in terms of today. Um, I have, as an archeologist, had an amazing opportunities uh, to meet a lot of incredible people, uh, to go to different places across the state, uh, to see things or touch things that most people don't get an opportunity to do, uh, and to learn a, a lot about um, our, our state, which has been really fortunate. Um, I need to quickly thank Queensland Museum, uh, the Cross River Rail Development Authority and Niche Environment and Heritage for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I hope this information has uh, been enjoyable. Um, please continue to join us through the week. Um, National Archaeology Week has a website, archaeology.org, um, so please check that out. You'll find that there's lots of other uh, events, field work, uh, seminars, all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, this is an annual event that we have on the 3rd of March, uh, every, uh, sorry, the 3rd week of May every year, and Queensland Museum always celebrates the National Archaeology Week. Uh, so thanks, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, as I said, hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, and tune in tomorrow. Uh, we've got Dr. Kevin Rains, uh, who will be speaking directly to you. Okay, thank you.